All right. Okay, this is my attempt number two. The end of the connection has been uh, so and so, not very stable, but uh, try to do one more time, maybe. Otherwise, I'll providentially, I'll say, well, maybe it's just not God's will for me to do the stream on this topic, which is not really that hot, especially among my uh, English speaking audience. It's not, it's not something that is uh, on the mind of, of many people, I'm, I'm sure. So this doctrine, descend, Christ descend into hell, okay, it's, uh, it's discussed much in the, in the more traditional circles, you know, this doctrine of Christ descended into a uh, special place, abode of the dead, subsequent to his burial, being laid in the grave, in the sepulcher, but prior to his resurrection, that something mysterious took place, he descended into hell, and there's this whole teaching associated with it that he let the prisoners free, the captives. They interpret that he went after the cross, after his being buried. He went into this special abode, this uh, Hades place, just the realm of the dead. And he broke the, uh, opened the gates and just let the prisoners free. And a number of people, even the righteous from Old, Old Testament saints were let out. And even Adam and Eve, uh, such as the teaching of Christ's ascension into hell. And it originates, I mean, it was kind of a believed in this so-called early church, but it got into this official status of the Apostle Creed, the Apostles' Creed, or the Apostolicum, as, it, as it's called, and widely used in liturgical churches, you know, Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox, a number of Lutherans and Anglicans, they recite every Sunday the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, and, and, and the rest. And it has this... Uh, <clears throat> And it has this line, this expression, talking about uh, Jesus Christ, when it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And this is more of a modern rendition, as I see, but uh, nevertheless, the point is the same. And born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And then he, dis after comma, there's a comma, he descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven as a seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead, the quick and the dead, says the older versions that I recall. But be that as it may, see, there's this expression that he descended to hell. <clears throat> and so since it is this part of the creed, a lot of older confessions uh, and systematic theology books that were built around this creed. And the reason is, it's just so easy to follow. The thought, well, people know this creed, many by heart. So it is good to just build your theology around the articles of this ancient confession. And you have some given order which you just follow so the first part would be about the father as the maker and uh, keeper of the providence he created everything else he rules and so forth. then his son so basically soteriology the person and the work of jesus christ so the even calvin and his institutes in his christology section in book two he has to discuss this thing the so-called christ descent into hell because, again, it's part of this uh, ancient Apostles' Creed. Now, the phrase, this expression, descended into hell, this descended to hell, was added, they say, uh, pretty late. It got into the Creed in about 6th century. So, prior to that, the 5th century, I mean, the, first of all, the Apostles' Creed does not mean, of course, that the apostles penned that creed. It does not originate with the apostles, nor was it written at their time, and so forth. They were not the authors, so, so forget about it. And it was, it probably got around about the end of second century, third century. There were some baptismal formulas which then constituted the main part of the so called apostles' creed. It was the baptismal formula for a catechumen. For a new somebody is being proselytized, 
and before their baptism, they would recite, what do you believe? I believe in this and this and this. So it's kind of a simple confession. And the reason it's called apostolic, it says that, it, well, it corresponds, it, it faithfully reflects the teachings of the apostles, the apostles' doctrine, as in the Acts 2. Now, whether or not it faithfully reflects everything that the apostles taught is, it, is a different thing, but that's such as the name of this document. So there's this line, and, and therefore, because you have that dissension into hell, theologians have to explain it. And... Um, the Reformed tradition, the especially continental Reformed tradition, got around this difficulty. They said, well, what do you believe? Well, let me read to you from the Heidelberg Catechism on this point, because the Catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, also follows the structure of the Apostles' Creed as far as what we believe concerning the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and all the all things in between. It says, uh, question 44. Again, this is a modern rendition. I'm used to more of a traditional language with a high floating and so forth, but this is the more updated. It says, why does the creed add, he descended to hell? Answer, to assure me during attacks of deepest dread and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. So it's actually stretched a little bit differently. This is this is a paraphrastic, but uh, I mean I know the Heidelberg. I, I've, I've taught it myself. So, but basically what it says is that why is it why is it added that he uh, descended to hell? Well, to assure me that in my deepest and and sorest trials and the sorrows that I have to encounter in this life, that Christ, my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, have endured in his soul. In all of his life, but especially in his dreadful sufferings upon the cross, he endured that hell. So I can be comforted that whatever sorrows I may encounter in, in my life, there are nothing in comparison with what Christ endured and underwent on the cross. And they correctly, Heidelberg Catechism, correctly identifies hellish agonists on the cross. So what they say, and Calvin did the same thing. He says, well, actually, hell happened upon the cross. And you think of that, yeah, because that's the dreadful place. Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon the tree. And at that point in time, even the darkness enveloped the whole earth, signifying the dreadful judgment of God and so forth. He was really plunged into this veil of unspeakable suffering. There was this darkness in the space of three hours, and there were other signs, and he drank of the dreadful cup of God's judgment. So hell happened upon the cross. I mean, I hope we, all, we can all agree on that point. But, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a but, a significant one. The traditional phrase in this so-called apostolic creed, makes it somewhat, uh, it's, a, it's a good orthodox explanation. It just does not square so well with the, with the impression you get from reading or reciting, and the Catholics and everybody, you know, the Anglicans, the liturgical people, they know this creed by heart. They know how it goes. The chronologically, the order seems to be, and it's uh, on the surface that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, was buried, and then he did, the common descended hell, and then the third day he rose again from the dead. So the traditional understanding, and Herman Hoeksema, one of the most prominent Calvinistic and Reformed theologians of the bygone century, the founder of the Protestant Reformed churches in the states, and you know, called hyper Calvinists and so forth. In his dogmatics, and I, uh, I read his uh, statements on that, he has to discuss this descent into hell, because again, it's part of the creed, of this ancient creed, and since the so-called reform creeds are based and built around those ancient formulations, they have to deal with the same. And they also say, well, the hell happened upon the cross. That, that's correct. But, and he says that that probably was not Hoeksema says it was not the intent of the early church, probably. So he has to admit it, but they have to do all this gymnastics to explain. Otherwise, 
a uh, uh, an odd uh, statement in the creed. But here, where I'm at in Russia, I mean, it's it's part of the huge tradition. It harks back to even Origen, who was a universalist, and basically the teaching is that they say that in between Christ's burial and his glorious resurrection, something mysterious took place. Christ descended into hell. And by that, and they say, well, the, the original phrase which got into the creed by, by the 6th century or so, was he descended into the lowest parts of the earth, even reflecting the language of Ephesians 4, the also Baha'i. See, Scripture has some, you know, points, uh, so, some errors into that, uh, to that direction that Christ actually descended. And what he did by that, he proclaimed liberty to, to the captives, and there was a whole bunch of people kept hitherto for, in this mysterious abode of the dead, not necessarily hell as we conceive of it, but just sort of the, the Old Testament uh, Sheol or Hades, just a place, a realm of the dead, not necessarily hell in terms of the flames of fire and all that sort of thing. And he descended there, he, he, he gave them uh, some sort of a uh, sermon, and hopefully, and he led them out. And there's a whole tradition, especially here, because I live in, in Russia. It's, you know, Orthodox Church is big and so forth, and they have those icons. So he leads the people out, the whole procession, and they claim Old Testament righteous people had been kept there prior to Christ's descending into this abode of the dead. And he got them all out at that point. And not a second earlier, and also Adam and Eve were let out. So basically, it was emptied. Now, uh, this teaching is associated with universalism. The notion that at the end of the day, everybody will be saved. If not now, then in the life thereafter, or whatever, you know, that uh, behind that uh, hill... They'll get us a second chance, or they will be finally saved through the same atonement of Jesus Christ. All shall be made righteous at the end of the day. So he will save everybody. That's universalism. I mean, it's clearly against so many uh, so uh, scriptures and, uh, and the whole current of scriptures. Uh, it's just clearly contradicts. So we're not going to deal with that on any serious level. It's, uh, it's clearly not scriptural. There is such a place as, uh, as hell. Now, but uh, this is the traditional uh, understanding that he descended into hell. But what does the Bible say? We're being people of the book, so what is, does it have a description foundation? Okay, yes, there is one text which is also kind of mysterious. It is, it is not easy to understand, and so for the dark saying of the wise. So we have to look at it. It's found in the first epistle of Peter in third chapter. And uh, it is an interesting uh, text. And this is actually the pillar text for this doctrine of Christ descended to hell and letting people out and all uh, such things as that. Uh, it's um, in First Peter 3. It's verses 19 and 20. But we have to actually read the preceding verse, verse 18, because otherwise we won't understand the divine of thought. It's, it's a complex thought of the apostle he says uh even verse 17 so he says look it is better he says if the will of god be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing so he says sometimes even if you do good you still suffer and he said that's that's okay for christ verse 18 says for christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also, verse 19, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by 
water and then he proceeds about baptism which is also a kind of an enigmatic statement in itself so peter has many dark sayings but uh several of them at least but here it says that he was quickened by the spirit by which he went and preached to unto the spirits and prison okay and so there are several questions uh that we have to deal with when did that take place first of all it says the quickened by the spirit uh he preached. What did he preach? And to whom? It says, to unto the spirits in prison. All right. And can we uh, think of any righteous person who is kept in in the prison? Uh, that would be another. So this is, it's interesting to uh, look at this uh, passage more closely. Watch this. He says, being put to death in the flesh, Christ was condemned, of course, he died, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, Herman Huxema strongly insists that this, whatever we conceive of this descent into hell, chronologically, this takes place not before, not prior, but subsequent to his resurrection being raised because it says quickened by the spirit christ was indeed he was quickened by the spirit therefore he rose from the grave the idea if he's quickened by the spirit he's no longer there so it is subsequent to the risen. so there's a, the first difficulty placing this event between being buried and uh and resurrection so you already have this problem but it says, by which also, so by what? By the Spirit, he went and preached. So it wasn't his personal appearance, probably by the Spirit, which might suggest that being God, being Spirit, when he says that, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, or that I am with you all, and, you know, such things, that, yes, he is with us, even unto the end of the age, but by the Spirit. Do you get it? So it's not some kind of a localized appearance of Jesus mysteriously descending. It is the spiritual presence by which, by the Spirit, he went and preached unto the Spirit. Now, another question. Uh, when did he go and preach unto the Spirit's in prison? You'll say, well, it, it, uh, if, if we read it this way, it appears that Subsequent to his resurrection by the Spirit, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. That would be the most natural uh, reading. But some people say, well, what this text might be indicating, that in this same Spirit, this same Spirit was active in Noah, the preacher of righteousness. Peter himself, in first chapter, speaks about the prophets, because they uh, had... He said that, uh, what does it say, uh, silver and gold, uh, yeah, being born, um, I can't find it. Oh, this is chapter, this is chapter two. I think it's, it's, uh, he says that the prophets, uh, by what time, I forget. Sorry for this. Yeah, sorry. It's just that I have so many versions open up and it's just that it takes longer to scroll down. But here's the point. See, the prophets, it says that uh, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Well, the gist of it is that the prophets had the Spirit of Christ. So if in this Spirit he went and preached to, to, the, uh, to the spirits who are in prison, if we add, as it were, who are now in prison, those who were disobedient in the days of Noah, so the meaning would be 
in this same spirit, Christ, in the spirit, he preached in and through Noah in the days when the ark was a preparing. By the very fact that he was building this ark, and it took, what, over a hundred uh, years, 120 years, it was a long construction project. But the very fact that he was proclaiming the judgment, being as, as a second of, of prefiguring Jonah, in 40 days this great city shall be destroyed. There was still no rain upon the face of the earth, but the mist was ascending from the face of the earth. The climate was different. There was no rain. So the whole project appeared stupid in the eyes of the uh, reprobate wicked who laughed, apparently scorned at, uh, at Noah. What are you doing? What, what in the world are you trying to build up? He probably had to give some explanation about the coming judgment and so forth. But they said, look, there ain't never been no rain and ain't coming and so forth. But uh, so you, you get the point. So the meaning would be that it was the spirit of Christ in Noah and through Noah preaching to those who are now in prison. That would be one. And it's kind of a majority uh, opinion among the reformed. Now, the trouble is, it's not a very natural reading, you know. Uh, because it, uh, it it appears to break this uh, sequence of thought and hook some up remarks on that. He says, well, probably not. The most natural way would be that, yes, it is subsequent to Christ's resurrection, and it is his spiritual reverberation, if you will, that those spirits which, are not, which were in prison, they were kept there, unto, of course, the coming judgment. It's not the righteous, not, the, not, not that nonsense. I mean, those who were disobedient in the days of Noah, those were the prime example of the reprobate who have a long time. He said the long suffering waited them and they never repented. Yes, correct. They were never given this grace to repent. But as far as the space of time, I mean, 120 years, <coughs> excuse me, and they still would not uh, repent. So they're now they're uh, kept in, in prison. So when Christ arose from the dead, what happened then, then was that their faith was truly and magnificently sealed. Come to think of it. Now, the spirits, those unclean spirits, the demons, Satan himself, of course they know that uh, it's coming. See, when Christ appeared in the flesh, they were the first ones to recognize. Disciples were too stupid. Who is this man that even the waves and the storm obey him and so forth? But the unclean spirits, the demons, uh, we know who thou art. Thou art the Holy One of God. Hast thou come to torment us before time? So they knew that the time is coming. Nevertheless, they tried their best to divert Christ from the set way straight to Jerusalem where he should suffer. And even in Peter, Peter himself, remember in the famous uh, uh, passage in, in Matthew 16, after recognizing Christ, the Son of the living God, the art, uh, and so forth. And nevertheless, when Christ begins to tell him that now he is going to suffer and so forth, he said, no. No, he takes the Lord aside. No, that ain't going to happen to you, Lord. Be merciful to thee. And then Christ has to deliver and administer this very stern rebuke. Get the behind, uh, uh, Satan, uh, because thou art mindful of the things of men, not of the things of God. So Christ and his minions, I mean, devil and his minions, uh, his servants, they tried their best to overthrow this plan and intent of God that Christ should suffer and through his suffering conquer death and Satan and so forth so bring about all these blessed results that thing was still in the making and they still entertained those evil spirits 
they still entertain some hopes that perhaps that ain't happening. Okay, you'll say, well, could they be that stupid? I mean, yeah, I remember 20-some years ago, as a part of the still uh, Evangelical Baptist Church, they were, uh, we had this discussion about the temptation of Christ, and one guy suggested and said, what's the point of Satan approaching Christ and you know, try to, to, to seduce him, to tempt him in the wilderness. Remember that oh, if thou be the son of God, tell these stones to become bread and so forth. So, well, he's the son of God and he's trying to tempt him. That's stupid. I said, well, yeah, it is stupid. But they still kept trying. For this reason, I mean, take the, the fall of Satan. If we conceive of him as created good originally. Some some of you would probably say, well, he was created evil from the get-go. But those of you who who, uh, who still, you know, kind of fall in line with the more traditional, there occurred some fall of Satan prior to the fall of man, of course. I mean, we don't know when, but the, uh, the thought is that uh, he revolted at some point. We don't know when, but he revolted against God, and that was his downfall. And of, and of course he was a blockhead. Jonathan Edwards even calls Satan the greatest of the blockheads of all time because he ventured to go against the Almighty. It is a war which is doomed before it commences. He ain't gonna win if you go against God. And the clear vision you have of God and those heavenly hosts, the soul of God's glory in the creation, in the magnificent work, and so forth. How can you revolt against such a magnificent being as God the Almighty, knowing that you're going to get it? I mean, you, there's no escape from it. So it is kind of a mysterious thing, that, but sin has this ominous quality to it. It darkens your mind. So in one sense, even though Satan is crafty and he knows a lot and he knows how to tempt people and how to lead into... In that way, he is proficient. But otherwise, his attempts are ultimately futile. And he should know it. Perhaps he does know it, but he can't help being wicked. And he can't help... Uh, uh, being in the way of God, trying to uh, place obstacles in his way. So that, that's his, because that's his role. So the thought is that when Christ rose from the dead, the world of those spirits kept in prison. Judah talks about uh, those, those spirits. They're kept unto this coming judgment day. And at that point, they were still, well, yeah, something bad's going to happen, but maybe it's not. But then Christ arises from the dead. That means, yes, the judgment day is now tickling. It's coming surely your way because Christ has accomplished all that was to be accomplished. In the last days, it begun, okay? That began with Christ's cross work in these last days. And we're living in the last days because there's, as far as the big events, they have all already occurred in Christ's glorious uh, resurrection. His, uh, of course, his, his death, uh, burial, and resurrection. So he's coming back. But so the last days. So. The idea is that the, the unclean spirits, they all realized, yeah, this is certain. Hell is coming. Hell is, uh, you know, we're going to get it. So that's the thought. That, that's the interpretation that Herman Huxuma gives to the, this passage. But even if we go back to uh, First Peter, we know that from the text, you cannot get this idea that uh, it's about some righteous people. In the Old Testament, no, it is those who were disobedient uh, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So it doesn't talk about that. Now, there's another 
text in First Peter 2, which they also use in its First Peter 4, 6, which might be suggestive on the surface. See, it says, for, for, this, for this cause, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to man in the flesh, but live according to the God in the spirit. The gospel preached to the dead. Now, if you take that literally, if the gospel can be preached to the dead uh, and they can be converted, it means, again, what is the true incentive and necessity laid upon us here to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God if you can preach to the dead people? And, and they might live uh, according to God in the spirit. Well, the passage does not suggest such a, uh, a foolish idea. What it means is that it, the gospel is preached to them who are now dead. And even some versions insert this now. It is an interpretation, but a correct one, necessarily correct one, that, that they might be judged according to the man of flesh, but live according to, the God, to God in the spirit. It's actually an explanation of what happened to the thief on the cross. He got judged. Okay, according to man in the flesh. He bore his punishment, which was due to him. He was a, a malefactor on the cross. He got what he deserved. He did die. Okay, in the flesh, he was judged, and rightly so. But live according to God in the spirit. He was judged by man, but he could live. Jesus says that even though you die, you shall live with me. So believers do experience this physical death. They get judged, some of them get judged by, uh, by man, uh, according to man in the flesh, but they live according to God in the spirit, because we have this eternal life after our physical death. We all believe in that. So that's what Peter is saying here. He's not saying that about uh, preaching the gospel to uh, those who are already dead. By the way, Back in uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, in, uh, when Peter says that he preached to the spirits, the word there is not preaching the gospel itself, because uh, sometimes the Greek word suggests that preaching is evangelizing. The, the word preaching suggests that in most cases where the gospel is preached. Here, it is simply he preached something, he proclaimed. It is not the good news. It's simply proclaiming his victory to those spirits that their fate is actually now certainly sealed. So that is the that is the idea. Now that might be mildly interesting. So what are the lessons that we can take from this? Well, number one, uh, the Reformed people do a good job of uh, giving the orthodox explanation to a dubious expression in the so-called apostolic a creed, and they have to admit that their interpretation is probably not quite in keeping with the original intent of the authors of that uh, apostolic creed. They have to do all this gymnastics. So, lesson number one we don't have to uh, stick to men's traditions to the point that we have to, boy, we have to go so great lengths in order to explain it in an orthodox manner. It has been explained in an orthodox manner, but the, the point is, why use it at all? In, in point of fact, some churches which do use this uh, Apostles' Creed, they omit that phrase, he's descended to hell. Many churches don't use it because it's well, because it's, it's just, it leads to superstition, all sorts of nonsense, and we, we just, we live it out. And that's okay, but the next question is, why use this creed? I mean, we have the Bible. Now, uh, Another lesson for us to take from this is that uh, any discussion, any notion which involves something other than the finished work of Christ, something that suggests that something had to be done subsequent to the cross to finish the job, diverts your attention from the cross. Here, according to this uh, ancient tradition, he went and opened the gates 
and let out and so forth. So as though what he did on the cross didn't get the job done. Even if we believe in this intermediate state, by the way, which is also an unbiblical notion, because in the parable of the Lazarus and the rich man, remember, Lazarus dies and he's taken into Abraham's bosom, right? And then the rich man also dies and he goes into hell. And there is an, in a, a chasm which no man can actually cross. It is, there's a fixed a chasm which we cannot cross over. And it's very clear in the text in, that, in Luke 16. So there's only two places. But even if we conceive of an intermediate state, which the Catholics call limbo, and dead people are kept there, what is the thing, even if we, even if we allow for such an intermediate state, what keeps people in the realm of the dead. It is the sentence of death because of sin. But if Christ puts away sin, if he truly propitiates, if, if he truly bears our sins in his body in the tree, if by his offering we have been sanctified and completely justified and washed and so on, it redeems us. It is his death on the cross. But see, this doctrine of his uh, uh, special descent to hell, it diverts your attention and fixes upon something that is very dubious and very speculative. And people talk about, well, how did that happen? And they try to discuss the details and so forth. They paint pictures of that event. But that's not what happened. The cross was the release, was the great redemption work. Because his sacrifice undid uh, the work of the devil and released the prisoners from that prison. You get it? So it is, we should focus on, on, on the things that the gospel focuses on, namely the cross of Jesus Christ, not his alleged uh, mysterious uh, descent into hell. So that's the uh, that's the argument. I hope it was somewhat helpful. May uh, may God bless you all. May Christ be glorified in us, and may we grow in the knowledge of Him. In His name, Amen.